Thank you for coming to what will arguably be the best session of today. Uh, I am joined here by my colleague, Ivan. Uh, Ivan Hello. runs product management for the Greenplum database, the open source Greenplum database. Uh, I run the field for the Greenplum database, so that includes all of the implementations that we've done over the last 10 years. Collectively, Ivan and I have been working on Greenplum for literally over 20 years, 10, 10 each. Uh, so this is a, uh, a very uh, uh, thankful time for us to be able to be here and present what we're doing. So today we're going to talk about how to make a Greenplum. And, and in the other PG comps that we've been on uh, around the world, uh, there has not been a lot of people who have actually heard of Greenplum. Has anybody heard of Greenplum here? Anybody? All right. <clears throat> so, so today we're going to talk about what it takes to actually make a Greenplum. And I think we need to start with what is a Greenplum. So 10 years ago, literally over 10 years ago, we started uh, looking around for a way to help customers solve a use case around uh, what has become known as big data, uh, but to solve use cases around analytics uh, and around uh, business intelligence and, and doing reports. And so we looked around the open source community and, and actually uh, it was a relatively easy decision to make. We would start with Postgres. And Postgres being 10 years ago, really the, the most full featured, most complete database that uh, existed in the open source market. The premise was that if Postgres is such a, a great relational database, then many Postgreses would be even more powerful. And so prior to, to putting Greenplum together, one way of getting to scale on Postgres would be to take your data and actually shard it, you know, take portions of your data and move it from one Postgres to another. And so, for example, if I had a billion rows, I could put 10 million rows in a Postgres database on server A, and 10 million rows in a Postgres database on server B, et cetera, et cetera. The, the hard part of that is coordinating the effort of querying all of those Postgres databases. Enter Greenplum. And so what we did was we actually took Postgres and uh, overlaid on top of it, or, or taught it, how to, uh, to dynamically query all of those Postgres databases as if they were one single Postgres. Additionally, we had to make, so once you make a distributed environment, you have to uh, allot for uh, any kind of errors or inconsistencies with the physical layout, so the networking or the hardware. And so additionally, we had to make uh, extra copies of the data. So again, if you had 100 million rows, or 100 billion rows, the way we implement uh, is actually to have two copies of that data so that if one of those Postgres instances no longer is available via the network or via the hardware, we have an additional Postgres database so that your queries can continue operating. Our integration strategy uh, has always been uh, to reduce the long-term cost of implementing big data. And, and I'll go into this a little bit more later. And I should also say, if anybody has any questions along the way, please uh, raise your hand and, and ask them out. Uh, we, again, centered around Postgres because of the worldwide technical collaboration. Ivan and I have been on a worldwide tour uh, you know, talking to the community, talking to users, and Postgres really is, has a lot of backing uh, behind it. And, and I think customers today are, are very interested in not being locked into proprietary databases. I mean, it was probably five or six years ago where it was still pretty commonplace to see people really uh, going towards a commercial uh, database like uh, Oracle, for example. But today, I think customers are looking to not be locked into anything proprietary. And so some of our major initiatives with our integration effort with Postgres has been to uh, up-level the Postgres that we have within Greenplum to be current. 
And I say this because uh, 10 years ago when Greenplum started, there were many uh, competitors that based their uh, products off of Postgres. And all of them basically forked from Postgres. So another uh, competitor that we've competed against a lot is, is one called Netiza. So Netiza forked with Postgres 7. We started a couple years later and we were able to fork uh, at 8.2. And for the last 10 years, Greenplum has primarily been made up of a 8.2 uh, uh, based Postgres implementation. Two years ago, we made the initiative that that was no longer a, an effective way to move to the future. And we endeavored to up level to the, to the current base. Uh, our latest version, Greenplum 5, is actually based off of Postgres 8.3. And last night we were talking to Gartner and uh, I, I believe his statement was, that's great, but Postgres is now at uh, 11. <laughs> and, and, and we recognize that. Just yesterday, if you're monitoring the, the internet, uh, we merged 9.2 into Greenplum, into the open source project. And so the, the first uh, go round from 8.2 to 8.3 took us a fair bit uh, to, to be able to execute on that. The subsequent uh, go rounds when we went from 8.3 to 8.4 to 9 to 9.1 have been each time easier and easier for us to do it because we figured out the best way to be able to do that. About two months for each version it takes us. Yes, so two months to go from version to version. We're on a, a very uh, fast track to be, um, par to be at parity with Postgres. And what that means for us is that, uh, one, we're uh, helping to uh, collaborate with the, the open source community, A. Uh, B, we, we get the, the benefit of leveraging all of the ecosystem around Postgres, again, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and then C, none of the other big data technologies are doing something similar to this. They're actually going down their own train. That takes a lot more resources, a lot more effort, and comes with a lot less compatibility, which we feel is the wrong strategy. Our goal for Greenplum 6, which will be out early next year, is to get to uh, Postgres 9.4. Uh, and that's important to us for a number of ways because, or a number of reasons, because at 9.4, there were a number of innovations in Postgres that really help when you talk about big data uh, and analytics uh, problems that we generally solve. So what would you use Greenplum for? If you, same thing as you'd use Postgres for. The exact same thing you use Postgres for, except uh, if you um, use Postgres today, you probably already are familiar with the ability to use geospatial techniques to do relational data, to write UDFs. But with Greenplum, you can do the exact same thing that you can do in Postgres, but you can do it with lots and lots of data. You know, we generally see customers leveraging 10 terabytes of data or more across their clusters. Um, we also generally see a lot of our customers doing, you know, tens and hundreds of terabytes and even petabytes of data across, you know, dozens if not hundreds of machines. So for example, one of our customers uh, is an internet company in the United States. With internet companies, there is a lot of data that comes in and they uh, effectively analyze the traffic so that their customers can place advertisements, which power a lot of their, um, uh, their own products. Uh, they literally have an 11 rack Greenplum cluster and have had that running for four and a half years now with uh, approximately three petabytes of data. And that is something th that basically powers their entire business uh, for uh, placing those ads. We also see a very common use case around uh, anomaly detection. And so we have a number of agencies around the world, uh, tax agencies, that are looking to detect fraud. And so in the US, for example, uh, when I submit a tax return, um, there are a lot of, of nefarious ways that um, bad guys can submit a tax return on my behalf. And because everything is electronic, they can actually get the money from the government very quickly. And most governments are trying to ensure that they're not giving their tax return money to the wrong people. Ooh. 
And, and lastly, another use case that we have is answering very complex questions. And so in Japan, uh, they need to be able to react quickly to extreme changing weather conditions. And if you think about all of the metrics that go into measuring weather predictions, there is a lot of data and it comes a lot quickly. They, they use ge the post just geospatial and they measure the tra traffic, weather conditions, et cetera, and it's a, a large analytical use case. So how does Greenplum work? So this was actually the meat of this talk, and, and in every PG comp that we've been at, I think this, is, this has been the most interesting of all. Uh, so we, we uh, pride ourselves in extending Postgres for massively parallel operations. And we've internally kind of dubbed this as massively parallel Postgres, uh, but you know, normally MPP stands for mer massively parallel processing. And so to do that, uh, we take uh, the queries that come in and uh, we have a planner. And the planner uh, basically understands that there are multiple Postgres instances that are all uh, operating with a portion of the data. And I usually take this opportunity to just to further explain that. So when I have a deck of, of cards, a deck of playing cards, uh, and I ask Ivan to find the jack of diamonds, Ivan will flip through that deck one at a time, 52 cards looking for the jack of diamonds. But if I were to deal that deck of cards out to this room, each of you would have one or two cards. And if I asked the entire room, find me the jack of diamonds, you could go through your one or two cards very quickly and give me the result. So that is the, the basic premise of this massively parallel idea. So once the plans are created, they're executed in parallel across all of the Postgres instances. So again, if you can imagine, I've got 10 Postgres instances, each with one-tenth of your data, all executing in parallel. The trick then becomes when you do joins and the data that you're joining is not located in the same Postgres instance, the trick is coordinating the efforts between multiple Postgres instances. So we start with a master host. And, and again, the master host is what all clients connect to. So if you use PSQL, if you use Tableau, if you use PG Admin, any client that talks to Postgres talks to our master. Any client that talks to Postgres and thinks of it as a single instance of Postgres talks to Greenplum in exactly the same way. The, the Greenplum master enforces all of the same syntax and semantics that Postgres does. And again, it basically makes it look like one massive Postgres database. We have a query optimizer. And the query optimizer is designed specifically so that it knows uh, a little bit of uh, how big your cluster is, how many Postgres instances, where uh, particular data might uh, actually exist. Uh, and generates the, uh, the appropriate uh, plan so that those Postgres instances can then go execute on them. And then, of course, we have a dispatcher. And so once the master creates that plan, it needs to be sent to all of the Postgres instances in the cluster uh, so that they can go execute on their individual queries. And uh, it's super... Um, Super important to make sure that, uh, especially as, as data is being shuffled back and forth, that there's somebody responsible to understand where that data needs to be shuffled. Uh, lastly, we have an executor. And so, um, you know, uh, as you're iterating over data, you're opening files, you're um, sending data to other Postgres instances, et cetera, that's all done via our executor. And then we have a distributed transaction manager that um, allows for the coordination effort. And this allows, um, or this gives each of the Postgres segments, we call them segments, each of the Postgres instances that are running, it allows them to execute and perform autonomously. So they'll, uh, they'll be the ones that decide whether they commit or roll back their transactions. But the, the DTM basically coordinates between all of those guys. So I talked uh, loosely about segment mirroring. Uh, has anybody heard of Hadoop? Anybody, anybody? Okay. So in Hadoop, 
they have a similar uh, strategy, which is spread your data across many, many machines, many cheap machines. Uh, and to do that, they, they built a file system, and we take data and, and, and spread portions of it around. Because these are cheap machines, and because there's lots of, of nodes, uh, they decided to have a default of three copies of your data. That means if one of your nodes goes down, you can still execute on the queries that you're looking for. We took a similar approach, but we leveraged Postgres in a, a relational database. And, and, and again, I think what we find most often is that the customers that we talk to are looking for a way to query data and actually most of their use cases are around structured data. And so taking a relational database approach to parallelism for data uh, is more in concert with the end result and the user experience than taking a file system approach to the same thing. And so for us to make sure that we have high availability, we decided to make two copies of each Postgres segment. And this is all done automatically. When you insert data into the master segment, it is copied over to the mirror segment. So again, if at any point in time, if that primary goes down, Greenplum will automatically switch to the mirror so that queries can continue to process. Uh, we keep a high uh, bandwidth uh, interconnect or network between all of those Postgres uh, instances so that that copy can happen very quickly and very seamlessly. So, so we were just saying as we got up here, the last session in here was around partitioning. And it's super interesting because uh, Greenplum also has had partitioning so that when you're querying big data, uh, you don't have to always go through all of the rows in the database. But we also have this concept of data distribution. And so I mentioned those cards that we distribute out to everybody here. Uh, we can take your data and distribute it by something uh, unique, for example. We can also take your data and distribute it randomly, uh, but that is uh, going to be less efficient, obviously, than uh, being able to take and hash on a specific key so that we know, for example, that this row goes over here and this row goes over here. If you look at each of these, you can think of these as individual Postgres databases that are running across a server. And so from a parallelism standpoint, you can imagine that if you had a single server and you were running four Postgres databases on there, you're still executing your queries in parallel just on a single server. In this example, we're adding six servers, so we actually have 24 Postgres instances running in this cluster. We can take each of those rows and, and effectively insert them into one of these Postgres databases. When the query comes in, if we are looking for a specific row, rather than asking all 24, we can just ask the one that has it. If we distribute the data randomly and ask for a row, we'll ask for all 24 databases, give me that row. 23 of them will say I have zero rows, but one of them will come back with the appropriate row. And so this gives us almost two levels of partitioning. One, we partition, and I'm going to use the word distribute. So we partition, but we distribute that data across multiple Postgreses. And then I'll talk in a minute. Uh, we also, within each of the Postgres instances, do partitioning even further. And so again, to use an example, if I have a fact table, uh, and I'll use this table here of orders. So I'm a book company. I take orders online. I get lots of orders. Those orders come to me and they have an ID, and I distribute those orders across all of these Postgres instances. So some of them have some of the orders, some of them have the other orders. Within that table, I can further uh, partition that data. So one example would be by date. And so in this Postgres instance that has a partial uh, amount of those orders, I can distribute, I can partition by date, and even further enhance the performance by not going through all of the orders on this one Postgres instance, instead going just to a single partition. We also introduced uh, many years ago this idea of polymorphic storage. And this is an idea where uh, traditionally in a database, uh, data is stored uh, by rows, you know, very similar to a spreadsheet. 
And that is uh, very good for certain use cases, but can be uh, optimized in other use cases. So we introduced this idea of column-oriented storage. So Greenplum actually looks like both a row database, a traditional row database, as well as a column-oriented database. <coughs> Further, we have, uh, have always extended uh, Greenplum such that it can reach outside of Greenplum for storage. And so in this example, we talk about reaching out to HDFS or to S3, but we could actually reach out to Oracle or MySQL or even just a, a CSV file sitting on a SAN uh, somewhere. And so again, if you uh, use the example here of a generic table, Many times, data is coming into the, the, the database uh, and it, it is most efficiently queried via a traditional row uh, format. As time goes on, uh, we're looking at data in a different format and uh, by uh, moving those partitions to be column-oriented, we can more efficiently store them. So again, if you imagine a, a spreadsheet or you imagine some rows of data, if you compress a row, it compresses this much. There are many more similar values in a column than there are in a row. And so when we compress a row, we can actually take what would be you know, this big and we can make it this big by compressing them by column. And then even further, as time goes on, you might want to archive some of this data over to something even slower and cheaper, like Hadoop. From an end user standpoint, I'm querying the table. I don't actually care if it's row-oriented or column-oriented or in Hadoop. I just want to query the data. So as, as my queries are coming in, we've got a effectively hot storage, we have effectively efficient storage, and we effectively have archival uh, near online storage. So I can do queries against this data even if it's you know, uh, stored somewhere else. Another way of looking at what I just talked about is, uh, is here. So for example, I'm looking to count how many orders are between two different dates. I've talked about segments, so again, you can look at each of these as different Postgres uh, instances, and we distribute all that data across all of them. Partitioning allows us to take that data and just look at a single slice. And so we're taking the uh, date field here, partitioning it in each of these Postgres instances, all of whom have a subset of the data uh, from the orders table. Another thing that we have, and, and again, we get this from Postgres, is the ability to do indices. And so most analytical environments, uh, when you think about what you're trying to understand from your environment, so I want to understand in my orders table how to get Ivan to buy more books from me. And I can, I can take a lot of data and understand that Ivan is in the US, he's about 35 years old, he's a white male. That would be one demographic that I could use to, to entice him with other books. That enticement would be to compare him to another individual that would be male in the US, white, 35. One way, and the traditional way of doing that would be to take a sample of your data and query it and try to make some assumptions between white males that are 35 in the US. But sampling means that you're not being as, uh, efficient, as, as precise as you really want to be. And so we allow for going over all of that data by spreading it around. Most often, a sequential scan of that data is the most efficient because we want to look at all of that data. However, there are, are several use cases where applying an index actually is super helpful, right? So when you're looking for uh, results with high selectivity, a single row, or you want to do a join between a dimension table and a fact table, sometimes indices can be very useful. Many of the other uh, ways of executing queries in big data uh, are, are designed to do things in parallel. Uh, however, many of them don't actually have the ability to support all kinds of these indexes. And again, we, we get this from Postgres itself, and we continue to add uh, as, as use cases pop up. Now, uh, a thing that we needed to add 
because most often we see Postgres used in uh, what we call OLTP or online transactional processing. So again, I'll kind of say similar to Oracle as a back end. Uh, what we found is that um, uh, to do analytical queries, the, there are optimizations that can be made that are easier done in an optimizer designed for analytical queries. So we've actually spent almost the last 10 years uh, working on an optimizer for big data specifically. This is something that we've also open sourced as part of the, the Greenplum open source uh, stuff. And I would, I would add, so in Greenplum there's two optimizers. There's the, the original Postgres planner that is modified slightly to support the MPP, and then there's an, uh, a guck to enable our, our second optimizer. So you can switch both at the system level or even at the query level if you want to accelerate some workload with this optimizer. Correct. And, and uh, really what we see, uh, we're trying to um, efficiently go through complex correlated queries, uh, some expression pushdowns, and, and again, dynamic partition elimination, as you've seen, uh, as we've already talked about it. And so, uh, for example, uh, an example of a complex correlated query here uh, would be one select that is actually being filtered by another select. And, uh, you know, a lot of optimizers actually execute this by doing a nested loop. And with smaller data sets, a nested loop is just fine. But as your data sets grow and grow and grow into petabytes of data, nested loops take longer and longer and longer to perform. And so what GP Orca does is decorrelates that as soon as possible so that there's not this uh, deluge of, of performance as your data increases. And what we've seen is that for correlated queries, uh, Orca can perform uh, about 100 times faster than the traditional Postgres-based planner because it's actually um, uh, looking to perform that on analytical queries for large data sets. Uh, similarly, by pushing predicates uh, down, uh, we're trying to avoid, uh, as you get more and more data, uh, having to look at uh, extraneous data that's not related to the answer that you're looking for. And so we continually try at every execution piece of this query to reduce the data sets so they can be performed as efficiently as, as, as possible. And by doing this, on average, Orca performs seven times faster than the traditional uh, Postgres based planner. For dynamic uh, partition elimination, uh, which again, I think you heard in the last uh, session and uh, you've seen here, we can go ahead and uh, determine, based on the partitioning scheme of your table, whether or not to even look through the data. And I always think of this as an implied index without the overhead of an index. Right, so if you see here, the, the filter of which partition you're gonna read is actually coming from a query. So static partition elimination is easier because at planning time you can see which partitions you care about. But this is at runtime picking the partition, so you need a dynamic partition elimination. That's really important. So, uh, SQL containerization, um, Pivotal actually has a couple of business units. One of them is around um, application development and, and really around containerization of those apps. We've taken a lot of that technology and a lot of that um, idea and baked it into what we call resource groups. And what we've seen uh, for a lot of use cases is that uh, we have customers uh, with business intelligence reports that need to go to either executives or to, to stores, and they have a, a, an immediacy to them. When I open up a report, I want to see the results. We also have uh, uh, customers with data scientists who are running complex algorithms within the, uh, within the database. They know that that complex uh, algorithm may take a little bit longer. We have the ability through leveraging uh, C groups to uh, effectively isolate queries to either specific CPUs in the servers uh, to um, allow for a specific amount of memory 
uh, to dial down the concurrency so that we can get the most amount of throughput through the system. And again, we do that all dynamically based on uh, thresholds that you set with, uh, with these resource groups. We've also containerized uh, you know, some of the compute environments. And so, for example, we have customers that run uh, Python uh, within, the, within the database, and they do that leveraging your standard Postgres PL Python. Uh, in, in Postgres, if you want to run a UDF, uh, there are a couple of different ways you can do it, uh, but by and large, when you're asking for extra libraries for Python, you need to install them on each of the servers. If Ivan wants to use 2.7 of Python and I want to use 3.6, that becomes very difficult because at the OS level, you'd have to do an install of both and make sure that your paths and your libraries are set correctly. By containerizing those uh, procedural languages, he can dockerize his 2.7 Python, uh, I can dockerize my 3.6, we can both execute and run those in isolation without necessitating a lot of the messiness uh, on the OS. And as a trusted user. And as a trusted user, yes. So that you don't need it, because it's in a container, we can, um, we can the, the DBA can be confident that they can't uh, reach out to the global system so the regular PL Python, you need to be a super user, but for this, you can be a non-super user because you're locked in the container. Yes? So because you're still an old, an older version of Postgres, you're still using the older PL Python? Uh, so so uh, yes and no. Because we're on an older version of Postgres, um, we, we, we are leveraging the infrastructure to be able to execute procedural languages. We actually created a, a new procedure, procedural technique called PL Container. And within there, uh, that is how we, we effectively uh, move the data tuples from Postgres to the container and back. And so the, the Docker container can execute on the individual rows that flow through as the query is being executed. But, but the PL Python code will be 9.2 currently. And once we release 9.5, it'll be the 951. We actually submitted a patch to um, Postgres 10 or 11 to, to a performance patch for PL Python because doing this testing, we found some of the serialization between um, the, the engine and Python had a kind of basically a performance bug. And so we submitted that patch to the latest Postgres and it gives something like a five or seven times performance gain. Um, in the past, uh, we, we effectively tried to um, uh, coordinate these backups and restores across all of the Postgres instances. That proved sometimes to be difficult for customers because of the locking that we really needed to do to ensure consistency across all of those Postgres instances. We actually just released a new uh, backup and restore utility. It's effectively a massively parallel implementation of pgdump. Uh, it allows for uh, better locking, so customers can continue leveraging the system as much as they want uh, while we, we take those backups. Uh, this has been a pain point for large customers uh, in the past, and we've effectively solved that now. Uh, one other thing that we've done, uh, which I think is super interesting, we have an extension framework called PXF, and that accelerates Hadoop access. So you may remember before, I talked about these external tables that can uh, access data from, by and large, from anything. Uh, one use case that we have is customers have Hadoop and they're looking to query it. Uh, Greenplum has a completely full-featured SQL implementation, which is different and more complete than, say, Hive or Impala, for example. And with PXF, we can query this external table and in parallel, uh, we will talk to each of the nodes in HDFS from each of the nodes within Greenplum. And that allows us to, one, uh, have easy access to HDFS, but also, two, to provide pushdown predicates to Hadoop. And so, you, again, you can kind of think of it if you have data in HBase on top of Hadoop, Greenplum can query HBase via a standard SQL statement, so via Tableau and reach across and ask HBase for an individual tuple uh, as, as you submit those queries. 
We spearheaded uh, this Apache project called Madlib. Madlib is a, it's based off of a paper that we wrote back in 2005, six, uh, which stood for magnetic, agile, and deep. So in 2006, we believed that uh, in order to efficiently process lots and lots of data, uh, a, the data needed to be magnetic. So in order to really do analytics, you gotta grab data from all different disciplines all over your organization. B, you have to be able to be agile, so you can't take a year and model the, the best model possible. You need to be, be able to be agile to, to take new data forms as it comes in. And of course, you have to be deep because you want all of the data. So Apache Madlib is an advanced analytics library that implements uh, approximately 50 of these very um, advanced uh, things that you'd see out of like SAS, for example. Uh, so linear regressions, logistic regressions, graph processing, uh, et cetera. Uh, we see this leveraged a lot of times in place of something as expensive as SAS uh, and, and uh, performs better because we run it next to the data in parallel, and again, all via open source. Uh, it is designed to be parallelized, but it runs within a Postgres-based system. Uh, we have graph analytics, and so we've seen a lot of customers implement some type of big data, uh, but when they want to do uh, something that's uh, graph related, so you think about like a network uh, log analysis of all the activity going on in your network, most of the time you're looking for connections uh, of the network. So if somebody comes in and uh, tries to, to hack into your network, you're trying to figure out any anomalies of all the places that that particular uh, log kind of goes. Graph analytics are very useful for that. So within Madlib, we've implemented the most common algorithms uh, that other of our customers have in the past had to install a specific graph database just to do this. That can be a pain because you're moving data back and forth between Greenplum, between the graph database, between HDFS, et cetera. This makes it all nice and easy within the same uh, platform. Yeah, just to add to that, so this, this is also part of Madlib, so that both the machine learning algorithms and the graph algorithms can be run on Postgres 10, 11, any version, fully compatible with Postgres, so you could just take this library, if somebody's saying, hey, we want to do Neo4j to do graph, you can now do graph in Postgres or in Greenplum at scale. Correct. PostGIS, many of you may be uh, familiar with PostGIS to do uh, spatial uh, queries within Postgres. What we provide, as, as Ivan said, is the ability to do those spatial queries but at scale uh, across terabytes and terabytes of data. So, Greenplum version six. Uh, we released Greenplum version five in uh, about August of last year. It was about a year ago. Um, it is open source, and so I encourage you guys to, to download it. It's also in the marketplaces of Amazon, Azure, and Google, so I encourage you guys to, to play around with it. Uh, we're, interestingly, um, rapidly uh, developing on Greenplum, and so we release a new version of Greenplum, a point release, approximately every four weeks. We're continually adding uh, uh, capabilities to Greenplum. So for example, the last release, which was 5.10, uh, we added uh, auto integration with Kafka. And so you imagine in a, in a normal environment where data is uh, being fed to Kafka, to a Kafka topic, Greenplum can uh, be configured to subscribe to one of those topics and just auto load uh, as data comes in. Again, as, as uh, companies have matured, having this data message bus uh, has become quite popular and having Greenplum be able to know about it and do it very transparently and easily allows for them to uh, execute on their analytics and not worry about their uh, ETL. For Greenplum uh, version six, our plan is to merge to yet another later version of Postgres. So we're targeting either 9.3 or 9.4. Uh, again, we've just, uh, just finished 9.2. Uh, we're looking to enhance um, a number of the things that we're doing, but I think most notably is Greenplum has always had this idea that we will provide the best analytical platform across lots of data. 
as we continue to up level to recent versions of Postgres, we're adding capabilities so that we can also speed up uh, short running queries or, or more of an OLTP workload. And so by the time we're finished with Greenplum, we look to, to effectively be uh, the best of both worlds where you can do uh, your short running queries and your long running queries uh, very easily and, and uh, conduced with the, the Postgres uh, merge. Another big thing that we've done is in the past at big data, uh, we uh, had bypassed the write ahead log. And so we, we currently don't actually make use of that and, and there's a lot of coordination effort that goes on across multiple Postgreses. In version six, we'll actually be using the wall log for internal cluster mirroring. And so this, this gives us the foundation for a lot of things. So mirroring will be first, but even replication and, and uh, CDC for change data capture, uh, all of these things become possible once we embrace the wall log. Uh, we are um, uh, working on safer uh, in-place upgrades uh, as well as replicated tables. And, and if you think about uh, a typical query, when you're in a massively parallel environment, not all of your data lives on all of the Postgres instances. So uh, for, for execution of a single query, if your data is not co-located, there's a period of time where we have to move the data so that it is co-located, co and that in, uh, elongates that query. In Greenplum 6, we'll have this ability to say, take this table and put it on all of the Postgres instances. And you can see that probably most useful uh, by uh, replicating your dimension tables. So if you have a small table that joins to your fact table, we can avoid the data shuffle by leveraging those replicated tables. And there's a bunch more. So we take pride in being able to say that Greenplum runs on all platforms. It really runs anywhere. Uh, traditionally, when we started back in 2005, you'd see us run on what we call bare metal. So we'd get fast machines with a lot of disk, we'd install Greenplum, each of those servers would have multiple Postgres instances, and, and things would go very, very fast. Uh, over time, we've seen uh, other vendors take Greenplum and package it up into an appliance. And so for a lot of customers, they're not very savvy in setting up many, many machines. Uh, and as you can imagine, if you have a cluster of machines and one or two of them are not set up in the same way as the others, it will affect the performance of anything running on that server. And so an appliance allows that all of those servers are pre-configured and you just plug it into the network and you plug it into the power and it just works. We've seen over time machines, bare metal machines and appliances have not the same amount of flexibility as virtualized environments. And so many of our customers run in a private cloud in either OpenStack or vSphere. And again, from a Postgres standpoint, from a Greenplum standpoint, those uh, uh, private clouds are really no different than running in bare metal. Uh, and so we're able to provide configurations for that. Uh, recently, over the last year and a half or so, uh, we've uh, provided Greenplum in the marketplaces of Amazon and, and Azure and Google. Uh, we've seen uh, other places like Alibaba take Greenplum and run it within their ecosystem. Uh, and, and it ends up being a very nice boon for our customers because they're able to take the same analytics, the same SQL, the same code that they're running on-premise they can do that off-premise, and so, i.e., in the cloud. And that allows them not to have to do something specific in the cloud and something completely different on-premise. And that's a, that's a nice story for, for customers to be able to, to code to. Our vision is, is that Postgres continues to expand and become the industry standard open source relational database. And we're leveraging that as our core engine uh, we want to have these elastic and flexible deployments. So our vision really would be, you know, if, uh, if a person needs 100 Postgres instances, that those 100 can uh, be spawned up and execute an analytic, and then dial that back down to 10 Postgres instances while there's less activity going on. 
We want to provide these mixed workload, high concurrency, mission critical use cases that customers are, are really trying to drive towards right now and continue the open source ecosystem integration. So continuing leveraging things like uh, GP uh, Apache Solar and um, uh, Kafka, Kafka Spark. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then lastly, we've actually, uh, just in the last week, uh, introduced our Kubernetes deployment of Greenplum for beta. And that allows you to deploy Greenplum within a Kubernetes environment, again, giving you that ability to run it anywhere and still have it managed uh, by an ecosystem that is really gaining steam in the environment. The analytics architecture of the future, uh, we feel very strongly, if you follow the DevOps train, you know, DevOps really is designed to enhance the experience of the end user. And so when we think about the analytics architecture, loosely I'll say data ops, uh, again, this is all to enhance the experience for the user. I think the user uh, is looking for a number of things and we can enhance those things by, by for example, leveraging in-memory uh, caching so that their queries can run faster. Um, we can leverage, obviously, the SQL analytics that we all talked about, but then uh, we can integrate in with the best products uh, that the community puts forth. And so I, I think no company, uh, and certainly no project, has the best of everything. There are a lot of projects out there that do very good things. We've chosen several of them, Kafka, Spark, for example, to integrate with. So we think Greenplum does a very good job of basically federating or leveraging the ecosystem where possible, and then uh, having an easy deployment mechanism and an easy way to operationalize that entire platform is, is key, and hence our embracement of the, the Kubernetes uh, movement. It, it's worth talking a little bit about what could you use instead of Greenplum. Um, so if you take a look at this chart, there's a couple ways of looking at database technology. On the lower left here, we've got proprietary um, SMP processing, so single machine. In the past, if you wanted SQL Server, for example, to go faster, the only way to do that would be to buy a bigger machine, more CPUs, more RAM, faster disk. A competitor to SQL Server, for example, would be like MySQL or, of course, like Postgres. So if you want Postgres to run faster, you buy a bigger machine, you get more CPUs, you get more memory, et cetera. At the top, you see uh, parallel processing. So the ability to have this shared nothing parallel analytic. There's many proprietary uh, implementations here, everything from Teradata to Netiza to uh, Redshift, for example. To Snowflake. Snowflake, uh, and, and they continue to pop up every day. Uh, but these are all based on proprietary uh, techniques that are not open, that are not part of the community. Secret hidden code. Secret hidden code. And so, so if you look at the other things that you can run on the MPP side, Greenplum is one of them. There are obviously uh, things that you can run atop of Hadoop. Um, but again, we are focused very primarily on uh, the ability to stay in sync with Postgres. So I so wanted to jump in on this one and really you know, there's been such a huge movement in the Hadoop world, and to me it's a little bit of a heartbreaker because you just see them starting from scratch for trying to write a database. And so <clears throat> what, we, what I think is that by taking the Postgres engine and running it at scale, we have such a better solution than what's provided on Hadoop to do querying and, and database workloads on big data. So I really would like to see the whole Postgres community um, kind of get into big data and say, yeah, we, we've got the database technology that we've built over 25, 30 years. That's the technology that we want to run database workloads at scale and not, for example, if you look at Impala, I think they have like 10 contributors and they all are from Cladera. They're writing the, all the database code from scratch. They don't have MVCC yet, they're, it's going to be 50 years. So I just see it as a huge waste of human energy. And we should get Postgres to be the database technology for big data. Here, here. Uh, so so uh, we talked a little bit about the technology. Uh, I'd like to quickly go through a couple of case studies um, just so you can understand 
the, the scope of where Green Plum is being leveraged. Uh, so Wall Street and, and Green Plum has been adopted very heavily across the globe uh, at financial institutions. And so some of the world's biggest banks, uh, uh, certainly some of the, the stock exchanges, are looking for ways to process a lot of data and do that very quickly. And that can be either because of regulation uh, or because of just being able to determine whether there's trends or fraud, et cetera. And, and that's literally millions and billions of calculations that need to be, you know, not only executed, but also stored. And in fact, I think the, what is the metric that one of those banks uh, leverages? So, um, queries per hour? Yeah, we're talking about be, having to run 10 million queries every hour to slice and dice and aggregate and group by all the calculations. Yes, and, and I'll, I won't read the slide, but I'll highlight this bottom here. The chief risk officer at one of these banks in the, in the U.S. said, uh, without Greenplum, we could not have achieved these results. And we take a lot of pride in being able to, to say that, and we actually take a lot of pride in that they're willing to publicly speak about how uh, key to their strategy Greenplum is. Uh, additionally, the... Cybersecurity. Uh, Cybersecurity is, a, is a, another use case that we see very often. Uh, everybody's online today, and uh, everybody's being uh, either breached or, or attempted uh, breach. And so uh, in order to actually stop that and analyze where all the holes are, there's a lot of data that needs to be churned through. So everything from desktops to logs of, of routers to you know, internet access from uh, programs and, and applications that are running. And so firms need to audit all of that very quickly and very easily so that they can stop anything that may be about to happen. Um, another, another use case would be around predictive maintenance. And so you can imagine a scenario where you have some type of, an, of equipment. So anything from wind turbines uh, to you know, trucks or cars that run in the, um, around the roads. And uh, if you look here at this chart, so when a failure starts to occur, so again, I'll use the example of a wind turbine. You have this, this wind turbine that's uh, producing energy and, and very early on, there might be you know, something wrong with it, uh, you know, some kind of anomaly or something from the environment that is affecting it. Uh, if you can catch that uh, problem early on, the cost to repair it is actually quite small. And the anomaly um, continues to get worse and worse over time. The amount of money that it takes continues to grow and grow and grow. For wind turbines, uh, a lot of things affect them. Heat, uh, wind, you know, obviously speed, uh, you know, whether or not it's lubricated, et cetera. Um, so uh, an anomaly that happens in Africa, for example, uh, because it's too hot, uh, can uh, indicate that at certain temperatures, other wind turbines in other places can also uh, start to break down. And so we take all of that data across all of the wind turbines around the world, and we start to do analysis across it. And we understand that you know, at certain temperatures, th this is a, an early signal, this is an early signal, so we can alert our customers that they need to take some, uh, some action. Okay, and a lot of other use cases, obviously. So how can I get involved? How can you get involved with this, uh, this movement? Uh, one of the ways would be to, to help uh, buoy up the Green Plum community. And so if you look at some of the stats that we have, Green Plum again is open source and is hosted here in, in GitHub. You know, we've got uh, literally hundreds of, of contributors, uh, lots of forks of the project, uh, a lot of people are watching it. Uh, the more uh, eyes on it, the more it will continue to grow. The more it grows, the more we continue to leverage Postgres. And, the and Pivotal is, our, the company we work for is Pivotal, and we do have quite a few contributors. But over the last few years, since we went open source in 2015, we've probably had about 50 different unique contributors that don't work at Pivotal, ranging from countries all over the world. 
So definitely encourage people to, to help out and get involved in it. Yes. We've got the mailing list, Slack channel, YouTube channel. Uh, and again, the, the, from my point of view, the, um, you don't have to necessarily contribute to the code, but contribute to the ecosystem. So install it, use it, use it for free, install it at your customers. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a game changing technology when you start to have data at scale. So, so one last thing I wanted to add is very much Postgres can be used for analytics and for big data. And it's really amazing for analytics and big data because of the extensibility and because of the SQL. And so I, I really hope that everybody in the Postgres world starts to think of it as an analytical database as well. But in order to do that, we need to really grow to big data and, and I think we've, we've invested a lot of time and energy thinking about how to help Postgres to do that. So definitely take a look at what we're doing. We don't have to be the last word in Postgres for analytics, but there's a lot of good insights that we found there that can, can drive towards the future solutions. Yeah, I think there, uh, there's two minutes left. We have a booth downstairs, so if you have questions, you can always come down and ask them. But we have a, a minute or two if you have any questions now. <laughs> yes. You show that yourself recognize well when it is laid down, okay, and send the queries to another slave. But there is nothing to the master A master failure. Oh yes, so so we have we have redundancy in the master as well. So if the master were to fail, we have a standby master that we can route queries through. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.